This is Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast which examines aspects and effects of sound and image-based cultural production. I'm the host and creator, Paula Blair. This week I'm going to do a reading of one of my publications, mainly because there hasn't been much opportunity to do a new recording lately and I won't have internet access next week to put an episode out then. I'm also going to take the break next week as an opportunity to make the podcast bi-weekly instead of weekly. I've received requests to do some writing and I also want to get back to writing and video making again. Editing these audio recordings takes significant time and I'm simply not earning enough from this alone to make it sustainable. So while it seems that I'm scaling back, the intention at least is to be able to produce more content and that content should be of better quality. And you can help me do this by keeping your ideas coming and by sharing with others in your networks who will benefit from or enjoy the audiovisual culture's work. Thanks to everyone who's been sharing on Facebook and Twitter. It's very much appreciated. The essay I'm reading today is entitled Remains to be Unseen, Envisioning the Disappeared in Willie Doherty's Ancient Ground and Patricio Guzman's Nostalgia for the Light. This is chapter 11 of the collection Peripheral Visions in the Globalising Present, Space, Mobility, Aesthetics, edited by Esther Pirin, Hanneke Stewart and Astrid Van Weyenberg. Full publication details and links are in the extended show notes available as part of the Pay What You Can't Hear benefits on patreon.com forward slash PEA Blair. Epigraph from Jacques Ranciere. Between what is visible and what is intelligible, there is a missing link, a specific type of interest capable of ensuring a suitable relationship between the seen and the unseen, the known and the known, the expected and the unexpected, and also of adjusting the relationship of distance and proximity between stage and auditorium. The Atacama Desert in northern Chile is marketed to Anglophone holiday makers as a haven, an unspoilt environment and a place of tremendous natural beauty. The peat bogs in County Donegal, Republic of Ireland, are similarly described as a symbol of hope and success. These sparsely populated rural sites, which until the late 20th century were primarily locations for scientific discovery and extracting natural resources, are becoming popularised and thus more central by the tourism drives afforded by neoliberalism. In the past, however, the Atacama and the borderland Irish peat bogs were not only geographically geographically peripheral to the centrality of populated urban spaces, during times of political violence in the 1970s and 1980s, these now touristic beauty spots were implemented as exclusion zones, harbouring the insidious secrets of troubled pasts. In these cases, therefore, tourism, or the process of centering the peripheral, can facilitate the forgetting or whitewashing of uncomfortable truths. This chapter examines cultural outputs that draw attention to the spectral psychic legacies of these sites, specifically the disappeared of General Augusto Pinochet's regime in Chile, 1973-1990, to and of the Northern Ireland conflict, 1969-1998, to thought to be buried in the desert and bogs. Chilean filmmaker Patricio Guzman's personal documentary Nostalgia for the Light and Northern Irish artist Willie Doherty's video installation Ancient Ground pose a resistance to systems of official forgetting by using their respective media platforms to centralise marginal themes, people and spaces. Working in forms peripheral to dominant mainstream moving image production, these filmmakers show how modes such as the essay film and the video installation can be used to highlight the trace remains of memories that trouble official histories and to facilitate the wider recognition of peripheral issues relating to conflict that fester unresolved in post-conflict societies. Nostalgia for the light and ancient ground have high production values but the forms of critique that emerge from these works uphold the transgressive impetus of third cinema 
cinema, a form of revolutionary filmmaking originating in Latin America, and early video art in the 1960s, both designed to activate spectators to engage critically with the world around them. While the film's audiences are not substantial, they are global, and perhaps attracted by the work's high-quality photography married with the scenic locations they feature. In centering marginalised spaces and issues, the works ensure that difficult pasts and truths are not buried along with the missing, while their circulation further expands a global network of shared traumatic experiences. As such, these works contribute to an alternative form of globalisation, in which what is traditionally peripheral in terms of location, social status, media practice and commercial enterprise can connect globally, in part by emulating the techniques of the corresponding centres. Given its global dominance, Hollywood's systems, conventions and economics are the centre in relation to which art cinemas, documentary and national regional cinemas beyond North America are generally peripheral. Nostalgia for the light and ancient ground present multiple layers in their peripherality. Their modes lack commerciality. They are examples of national, regional, cultural production only exhibited in specialist circumstances, which are relatively under-examined in academia, and they deal with a topic involving minor groups that are often met with denial and exclusion. The problem of the disappeared, lingering in many post-conflict and post-dictatorship countries, is particularly distinctive in that the nature of the disappearances means that it is relatively easy for state authorities working in conjunction with mass media to suppress both official historical accounts and the personal testimonies of families and survivors. The assumed reasons behind why an individual was disappeared are often linked with informing or demonstrating resistance to oppression, meaning that public references to the disappeared tend to be met with denial and social exclusion. Moreover, as Theresa Mead explains, most survivors are simply too traumatised to communicate the extreme torture they experienced and to which they were forced to bear witness. It is the arts where the most substantial accounts seem to emerge, given the ability of documentary and fact-based fiction to tread the precarious line between evidence and testimony. As practitioners Guzman, born in 1941, and Doherty, born in 1959, have been establishing a gaze on behalf of the socio-political periphery which can be turned back on the centre in their respective home regions. In drawing their works together, I identify the possibilities that arise when common socio-cultural themes and issues connect across space and time. The affinity drawn here between Chile and Northern Ireland is a starting point in illustrating how marginal issues in peripheral places or situations can form synergies beyond the dominance of globalising capitalist systems. This is mirrored by practitioners working against the tide of populist commercial media, supplying a consumer demand that apparently stems from freedom of choice, but is in fact engineered to maintain depoliticised passivity. In shedding light on the subtle form of globalisation developing from the circulation of connective experiences, this chapter points towards the broader significance of the arts and humanities in transcending borders to contribute to conflict transformation and transitional justice. These works and their critical analysis promote space, including global pockets of connected spaces for the long overdue dialogue and intervention needed to enable social change. Doherty's eight-minute video installation, Ancient Ground, is a conceptual audiovisual poem comprised of a series of views of rural pathways and bog marshes, framed in different proximities and filmed in different focal lengths using high-definition telephoto lenses that carefully scrutinise the surface of the Donegal landscape. On the soundtrack, a woman's voice describing acts of searching conjures further images of what may lie concealed beneath the seemingly unspoiled surface. As the sequence progresses, however, the images increasingly reveal past human interactions with this place, the tarmac path, sodden ditches, an abandoned car door, netted piles of peat blocks. 
the unidentified disembodied voice is soft and melancholic, with a grain indicating age, as she lists feelings and objects related to what can be understood as a body she is looking for, apparently buried in the peatland. In the form of a minimal poetic testimonial, she claims to walk the same paths every day, hoping to see shifts in a landscape that has taken millennia to form, which would reveal what has been hidden. As she speaks, the shots reveal surface details and the lighting illuminates the muddy depths of the bog water. In close-ups coinciding with her descriptions of looking for a sign, the texture of weathered rocks, half exposed on the surface, is photographed in haptic detail, while the grass in the back, sides and immediate foreground of the frame appears in varying degrees of soft and blurred focus. The images slowly change between different characteristics of the bog, soil, moss, grasses, mud, pools, rocks, roots, insects, flowers and so on, and with Without the voiceover narration, could easily be mistaken for a slide set of nature photography. The shots are indeed moving images, but collapse the boundary between stillness and movement. For example, in a later shot of the sedimentary layers and the exposed ridges where peat cutting has taken place, the focus is pulled and shifts between the details of roots and grains at different proximities to the camera's probing gaze. Performing these changes to the focus in the cinematography and editing reflects how the viewer of any lens-based work is at the mercy of externally controlled shifts in vision and perception. The detail in the focus and the downwards tilt in many of the shots also give a sense of a careful and intimate vigil from a subjective point of view, as if the scene is viewed through this woman's eyes during her daily search. The monologue evokes issues known to have affected the families of those disappeared during the Northern Ireland conflict, which are aligned with the passing of time. Quote, the seasons, the passing years, the whispers, the shame, the punishment beyond words. Unquote. An almost ekphrastic allusion to Seamus Heaney's bog poems, particularly the graphic The Growbill Man, emerges when the woman utters in conjunction with images of dank surface water and the ridge cutting hooded, bound, weighted down, discarded, unmarked, the callousness. Given the Heaney connection, these terms evoke the ancient preserved bog bodies often found bound, hooded, weighted and buried with no shrouding, ceremony or possessions other than the clothes they wore which were also largely preserved by the bog. The callousness of the unmarked graves indicates that this burial method was reserved for wrongdoers. The practice was revived during the Northern Ireland conflict as punishment for suspected transgressors and informers or served as a warning to others to comply or face the consequences. In the 1970s, the Provisional Irish Republican Army kidnapped, murdered and secretly buried suspected informers. Most known victims were from Catholic nationalist areas and the IRA has claimed responsibility in most of these cases, releasing only vague details of burial sites. This has led to extensive and only partially successful digs since 1999. Out of at least 16 known bodies, six remain missing. The 10 that have been found and identified were discovered on the liminal spaces or landscapes of beaches, peat bogs and fields, largely in areas along the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, that is, the geopolitical frontier between the UK and Ireland, which also splits the province of Ulster. Given the rumours about informing, often professed by the IRA, the families have been met with denial and shame within their own communities. It was only with the ceasefires in 1994 that space began to to slowly open up for them to confront what had happened and to ask for answers, but this still often led to their social exclusion. In the ancient ground, the frustration of endless concealment and waiting emerges clearly in the aged voice, reciting the sparse lines as close-ups of muddy water are penetrated until the darkness reveals no more. Quotes, the small details, half remembered, the dank smell, the forgetting, the regret, the silence. Unquote. Some wider shots reveal the overcast grey sky as the stillness of the scene reflects the lack of development in this woman's burden year by year. Here the loop feature of the installation becomes a politicised aesthetic feature in that it reflects the repetitiveness of this endless unchanging cycle and the stagnant conditions of the situation. Her closing words, the silence, implicate the spectator and speak directly to the networked political 
political, social and media establishments' complicity in maintaining the air of silence hanging over these disappearances. A similar silence burdens many citizens of post-dictatorship Chile. Upon first glance, Patricio Guzman's documentary Nostalgia for the Light is a personal account of the director's lifelong interest in astronomy. However, according to Patrick Blaine, the film, quote, constitutes the most complete attempt in any medium to document Chilean national life before, during and after the Pinochet dictatorship. Unquote. Guzman's 90-minute film, produced by his partner Renate Sachet, is a complex meditation on memory, time and the cosmos used to explore multiple levels of metaphor for absent presence as denoted by the trace. This all takes place under the stark clarity of the skies over the Atacama Desert, where ancient civilizations left thousands of geoglyphs, works of art made by arranging stones or earth, which remain largely preserved in the otherwise barren and arid landscape. The meanings of these markings have long since been lost and they are now merely self-referential abstract traces indicating that this activity happened at all. The film's rumination on the distant past also includes mummies that predate the European discovery and colonisation of the Americas, the preservation of which bears similarities with the bog bodies implied in Doherty's ancient ground. The film's introduction consists of Guzman man's voiceover narrating a personal account of his childhood interest in astronomy, noting that at the same time as, and I quote, a revolutionary tide swept Chile to the centre of the world, science fell in love with the Chilean sky, unquote. At 10,000 feet above sea level, the Atacama is the driest desert on earth and boasts some of the clearest skies and greatest visibility of the stars, making it a huge draw for astronomers who search the heavens using the world's most powerful telescopes. They discover stars that are long dead, but the traces of which remain visible as their light takes millennia to reach Earth. The starlight, thus, is a visible trace of something no longer there, no longer alive, of what was and is no more. Deepening this symbolism, the film also reveals the women searching the Atacama for traces of loved ones who were among the 3,000 disappeared during Pinochet's regime. It follows them as they excavate the deep humanizing mass graves where the remains lie in an attempt to find the tiniest fragments of bodies or possessions. The tension between extremes of invisibility is threaded throughout the film as are traces of the ancient indigenous civilizations, highlighting the gaps between the known and the unknown, the mysteries of the ancient past and the secrets of a difficult present. When asked by Guzman what he thinks of the women searching the desert, astronomer Gaspar Galaz voices his concern at the reticence of a society that understands astronomers much more than people trying to find their dead. He says that in a way their quests are similar except that he and his colleagues are untroubled by their excavations of the sky. It transpires in the film that the calcium that falls to earth from space is identical to that which formulates our bones. The discoveries made about the elements of the universe are thus paralleled by the women combing the desert for bone fragments. They are investigating the mysteries of the past in space connected at a fundamental level to the mysteries of the present by the very elements that make all of us who we are. While a steady cam in a full shot follows one of the women carrying a spade and crunching along the desert in glaring sunlight, Guzman's voiceover explains that to avoid the bodies ever being found, quote, the dictatorship dug them up and disposed of the remains elsewhere or threw them in the sea, unquote. The sense of this misdirection pervades the rest of the sequence. The woman stops and the camera catches up with her, remaining behind her left side and watching as she scans the landscape. A cut to a static wide-angle shot with a long depth of field shows another woman as a tiny speck moving across the plane in the central horizontal axis of the frame. Her body is engulfed by the rocky plane in the foreground, the arid hills in the distance and the cloudless azure sky filling the top half of the frame as the wind is heard blowing steadily across the expanse. The sequence visualises Galaz's comparison of the Atacama to the vastness of space and 
demonstrates the futility of the women's search with poignant efficacy. Guzman's narration deepens this by explaining the stretches of time the women of Kalama have spent searching. Many searched for 28 years until 2002, but since then only a few have continued. As is the case in Ireland, traces and fragments of bodies are still being found, and several of the now elderly women have devoted their lives to not giving up hope. In the same sequence, Guzman explains that during filming, the body of a disappeared female prisoner was uncovered in another part of the desert. In the detail that the woman in ancient ground yearns for, Guzman's camera probes the surface of the dig to show the ghostly yet all too real fingertip and nail emerging out of the compacted sand. It is photographed in the centre of the frame in such clarity that the lines of the fingerprints are displayed, showing the extent of the preservation. This shot is followed by two more brief stills taken as the body was uncovered. The first shows the feet still wearing sandals, their position indicating that she was buried face down and uncovered. The second shows her shriveled hands crossed at her outstretched wrists protruding from what appears to be sacking cloth. Notably, the spectacle of showing the body in full is avoided. The three emotive close-ups ending the searching sequence communicate both the gravity of the situation and the women's reasons for continued hope. Two of the women are interviewed at length, both delivering moving and difficult testimonies. Vicky Saavedra relates her memories of receiving fragments of her brother José Saavedra González, including his foot still in shoe and sock, and how, for her, this was a reunion. At the time of filming, Violeta Berrios had found no trace of the person she was looking for, but was determined to keep searching for as long as she can. She was told by the authorities that the body were excavated, bagged and dumped in the sea, but she questions this, declaring, quote, At this point in my life, I'm 70, I find it hard to believe what I'm told, they told me not to believe, unquote. She talks of the struggle to keep going, but says she and Vicky pick themselves up every day and return to the desert more hopeful than the day before, quote, and more impatient to find them, unquote. Her pain and desperation are clear, but so is her formidable strength. These are women who refuse to be victims, who simply want rightful burials for their dead. At once hidden beyond vision and gone without trace, the physical disappearances are mirrored by processes of state-sanctioned forgetting. The dissolving of all evidence of what had existed causes a loss of meaning and connection over time, just as is the case with the geoglyphs on the landscape and the stars in the sky. The geoglyphs and stars embody a fissure between states of being visible and invisible. The geoglyphs can be seen, but what is seen is inaccessible, and the stars must be probed with technologies that expand vision in order to be understood. This lack of communicability reverberates through the experience of loss through disappearance. In contrast to the women's needs for figurative light to be shed on the desert, the astronomers gaze at objects that cannot be discerned with the naked eye in daylight. It is the darkness of night and the vastness of space that facilitates astronomical discoveries, while the shroud of secrecy and denial continues to hide the disappeared bodies. The sensitive issue of the disappeared of Pinochet's regime is easily cast to the nation's social, cultural and political peripheries, lest the current economic stability and prosperity of neoliberal Chile be disrupted. Today, Chile leads Latin American nations in human development, competitiveness and income per capita. On the surface, it is in a state of peace with economic freedom enjoyed by the majority, although its indigenous populations continue to experience social, economic, cultural and political exclusion, alongside those who have suffered directly from Chile's recent torturous past. Patricio Guzman's personal history intersects with the events that have transpired there since the 1970s. As a political filmmaker from the outset, Guzman's career has played out on the far reaches of the margins of populist commercial production and distribution. Notably though, the circulation of his work has been dependent on networks he formed in Europe and indeed on his own exile there since the 1973 military coup d'etat. In 1970, while Guzman was studying film in Madrid, Salvador Allende was elected president of Chile. The allure of a Marxist head of state was too compelling for him to stay abroad, so he returned to Santiago. As part of a like-minded group, 
he filmed the revolution happening in conjunction with Allende's governance, initiating a lifelong filmmaking career centred on political inquiry. His crew on the first year, made in 1972, was young and the equipment modest, filming on 16mm black and white film. They were disorganised but enthusiastic, as emerges in the film's positive propaganda about social change across the provinces of Chile. When finished, it was transferred to 35mm in Buenos Aires. In France, renowned left bank filmmaker Chris Marker had heard about the work and this opened up Europe to Guzman. He took the negative and soundtrack to Paris, where it was redubbed in French. The voices were provided by popular actors as a favour to their friend Marker, who drew in francophone audiences to see it and led to the film winning European Film Festival Awards. This transatlantic connection was fundamental in ensuring the circulation of Guzman's continuing work as events in Chile took a dramatic turn following the coup. Guzman was targeted and the negatives of his early films were destroyed by the military as Chile's history underwent revision. Guzman felt compelled to film the events, but his access to equipment was severed. In 1974, Guzman's cinematographer Jorge Molar Silva and his partner were among the thousands who were disappeared by Pinochet's regime. Guzman wrote to Marker about the severity of the situation and soon received a package containing high quality film stock. For the first time, he could record with synchronised sound, which made the spontaneous filming of the events appear more real and urgent. With all this happening during the epoch of Cinema Verité in Europe, direct cinema in North America and third cinema in Cuba and Argentina, Guzman not only joined the political revolution in Chile in resistance to the dictatorship, but also participated in radical shifts in global independent documentary production, which more than ever directly intersected with everyday life. In filming what would become the Battle of Chile between 1975 and 1979, Guzman had to learn fast how to work economically within constrictions the crew posed as a French news team, and how to select the most indicative examples of the events that unfolded. What was needed was a robust theoretical framework to focus the filming and a sense of chronology. The result had to be distinctive from state-controlled news broadcasting and propaganda. The crew was able to film every day while conserving the limited supplies provided by Marker. As a result, the Battle of Chile reveals invisible truths, providing evidence for the atrocities committed by Pinochet's government and his concealment of the detrimental impact that his about-turn renationalisation schemes had on miners and factory workers. It was also the film that forced Guzman into exile. He moved back to Francoist Spain in 1973 and edited the film with the help of the Cuban Cinematography Institute. Institute in 1974. Chile, the Obstinate Memory in 1997 depicts Guzman's return from exile to screen the Battle of Chile, which had been banned under the dictatorship. Chile, the Obstinate Memory places the testimonies of people's lived experience of the regime in dialogue with the young people of the post-memory generation, who, through the facilitation made possible by the screenings, began to learn about the violence being cleansed out of history, including the more than three thousand dead and disappeared. Unlike the coverage of Northern Ireland's Disappeared, which is beginning to emerge in mainstream media as described below, to date Nostalgia for the Light has not received a theatrical release in Chile and has only ever been shown on television during the night. In addition, apart from brief availability on the Sky Satellite Company's pay-per-view service around 1999-2000, The Battle of Chile has also rarely been screened there. Thomas Miller Klubach points out that it took the intervention of a multinational corporation that has played a significant role in the globalisation of telecommunications services to screen such films, that is, through their commodification and only to a limited number of households. He states, quote, In Chile's neoliberal democracy, memory and history are subject no longer to the censorship of military dictatorship. Today, they are commodities contingent on the vicissitudes of the market and decisions made by multinational 
national corporations, unquote. Whereas Pinochet's government actively diminished press freedom of speech, subsequent democratically elected governments have sustained a passive silence concerning the past. Although the torture and disappearances were acknowledged by the left-wing Concertacion government, the Coalition of Parties for Democracy in power in 1990-2010, to 2010, for example, its refusal, and I quote, made to press for reparations or to hold the military responsible for human rights violations allowed them to govern without confrontation, unquote. This suggests that access to unofficial histories is only available to those willing and able to pay for it. The more radical arts may find ways of ensuring that the ghosts of the past will not die, but they remain reliant on global distribution and screening networks to maintain the presentness of the past. An example of how the persistence of the more niche arts can pressure mainstream media into acknowledging marginalised issues emerges in the Northern Irish context. On the 4th of November 2013, a co-produced documentary on the disappeared aired on BBC One Northern Ireland and RTE in the Republic of Ireland. Its director, Alison Miller, has made many television documentaries that mine marginal stories in Northern Irish society and culture, indicating that there is interest in accessing lesser-known issues more generally amongst filmmakers and audiences alike. The disappeared includes testimonies from the victims' families, some members of which were speaking publicly for the first time. It took four decades for this sensitive topic to be given any real airtime on mainstream regional, not national, television. Given the novels, poems, paintings, music, photography, video art, plays, community arts and even experimental operas that have kept the issue present to some degree, the break in silence in mainstream mass media was inevitable. In this more mainstream appearance, the significance of the arts confronting this issue is evident in the programme's inclusion of excerpts from Heaney's bog poems. Like Heaney, Doherty is another artist who has become high profile due to critical acclaim and the prize culture in the art world. In a similar way to Heaney's, important messages that society and politics in Northern Ireland remain reluctant to confront lie beneath the fine art veneer of Doherty's works. A uniting factor between Guzman and Doherty is that despite their political messages they do not make work expressly for didactic purposes. Rather, the issues are there to be teased out by what Ronciere would describe as the emancipated spectator, who is prepared to engage critically with the form and content. The sparse poetic language in the voiceover monologue in Ancient Ground evokes ghost stories deriving from Irish traditions of oral storytelling and establishes a link to another kind of disappearance, namely the mass loss of population during the Irish potato famine in the mid-19th century. These cultural codes are mapped onto images that at first glance look like idyllic picture postcards, a method of which allows such sensitive topics to overcome the implicit silencing of free speech by either the state or paramilitary organisations. In both contexts, the authorities maintain an air of silence, waiting for victims and survivors to die so the problem will die with them. In defiance of dominant discourses. Works such as Nostalgia for the Light and Ancient Ground hold these individuals and their stories in posterity. They remain as spectral, visible, circulating presences, the distribution of which is at once hindered and facilitated by their marginal, non-commercial modalities. Many of Doherty's video installations can be read as critiques of media representations of events and of general problems with mediated versions of memory and history. He is drawn to the shared cinematic experience of being in a desensitised room and his use of film language plays with the generic aesthetic codes of horror and thriller fiction. This is reflected in his exhibition techniques. His moving image work is always screened in a blackened, muted space lit only by the screen, with the viewer having to blindly turn at least one corner to enter the space. He consistently plays with vision and enforced lack of vision. Often, what is seen on screen merely draws attention 
attention to that which viewers are prevented from seeing, situated beyond what seems to be revealed or at least implied in the frame, in drawing out performative acts that deny the passive spectatorship found in commercial cinema, viewers are also invited to question the recalcitrant political authorities that ultimately control the field of vision to which the public has access. This is the manifestation of my earlier claim that Doherty has constructed a gaze which returns and disrupts that of the controlling centre. In adopting some of the methods of the centre, his installations give the viewer an opportunity to see peripheral issues through alternative frames and to open up a path of vision back to the centre. It is the critical, active viewer who will see beyond the protective, idyllic veneer of a work such as Ancient Ground and become aware of those denied social justice. As an established and successful international fine artist in the 2000s, Doherty has been able to acquire crew and increasingly better quality equipment to make his work and, as is the case with Ancient Ground, tends to use 35mm film, now rare in the film industry and reclaimed by artists, which is then transferred to HD cam. Just as the video grain reflected the spontaneity and closed circuit feel of covert surveillance in earlier pieces such as Black Spot in 1997, the high definition camera and high key lighting arrangements in Ancient Ground capture durational shots of the landscape in all proximities with nuanced focal depth to scrutinise the objects in the frame in forensic detail. The aesthetic effects of both techniques draw attention to what is not in frame that perhaps ought to be. In the earlier surveillance themed work this would be an authoritative search for transgressive behaviour. In Ancient Ground the searcher represented by the ageing woman's poetic monologue and the more subjective cinematography is indicative of the family's hope that shifts in the political as well as physical landscape will reveal the remains of the supposed transgressors. Doherty's video works may now have high production values which afford the intense scrutiny of the landscape seen in ancient ground but in terms of equipment and production had more modest beginnings in the 1990s. Even still his first foray into video the two channel the only good one is a dead one from 1993 was nominated for the 1990 for Turner Prize, a prestigious award for contemporary artists living and working in the UK. Although today the video form experiences increasing recognition as a fine art that places it at a far remove from its countercultural beginnings in the 1960s, it is still mainly accessed by niche gallery audiences. Ancient Ground is an example of high-end production in video afforded by Doherty's international acclaim as a video artist, photographer and educator. Although his body of work is substantial and many solo exhibitions and publications have been dedicated to it, his videos and photography are often merely footnotes, if acknowledged at all, in contemporary arts scholarship beyond Ireland. Chilean documentary is also under-acknowledged in international film studies, with Guzman again appearing as a minor reference to exemplify the nation's output in documentary texts with an international focus. He is discussed more, but still much less, than his French counterparts in scholarship concerning the essay film, which is defined by Paul Arthur as, quote, a meeting ground for documentary, avant-garde and art film impulses, unquote. The subjective, do-it-yourself, personal intellectualism set against the transnational production backdrop, which can further characterise this mode, sets the essay film apart from other forms of non-fiction filmmaking, and it is also largely accessed by specialist viewers only. While the City Symphony, Cinema Verite and the Archive compilation are widely divergent forms, they are all clearly identifiable as documentary and films associated with these modes are firmly part of the documentary canon. Given the essay film's ability to marry objective non-fiction with self-reflective, reflexive, poetic avant-garde approaches to cinema, it is hard to label this method beyond articulating a sense of the 
the personal as the political. A convergence with video art takes place in that many gallery films take the essay form, such as, for example, the installation practices of Chris Marker and Jean-Luc Godard. Video art, in particular, generally experiences cycles of financing, distribution and marketing different to feature-length films of any kind, taking mainstream film industries such as Hollywood as the centre. Independent video production and experimental forms of documentary both operate on the margins of moving image production more broadly, yet many individual works, including the films under discussion, are circulated worldwide and often depend on international support to fund and facilitate their production and exhibition. While this peripheral yet global network may find collaborative transnational ways in which to operate, a problem arises when negotiating between producing a marketable product and dealing with traumatic issues with sufficient sensitivity to those affected. The ethical dimensions of dealing with the pain of others are much debated in trauma and memory studies and artistic engagements with sensitive issues do risk reducing them to aestheticised images. Both films discussed here find a balance between aesthetic production value and facilitating the release of testimony, the delivery of which creates the potential to generate affective connections and to extend the live archives of unofficial attempts to attain social justice and conflict resolution. Resolution. Ancient Ground and Nostalgia for the Light are visually rich works internationally marketable as fine art and a documentary masterpiece, respectively. Doherty's video was first screened alongside an accompanying photographic series and some older work in the Disturbance exhibition at Dublin's Hugh Lane Gallery in 2011. Many of the photographs featured traces of unnatural human interference with the bogs, including the ditches where peat had been extracted for fuel and the red door of a car becoming consumed by the grass growing through it. The latter image invokes similar scenes in Doherty's earlier photographic works, such as Border Incident from 1994, featuring a burnt out car, highlighting the ambiguity between images of ordinary criminal activity and paramilitary signs of control along Northern Ireland's border with the Republic of Ireland. These ambiguities transfer a responsibility to construct meaning onto the viewer, testing our preconditioned assumptions based on how news media and generic fictions frame such images. This onus on viewers to negotiate between different viewpoints and to actively determine meaning then includes an ethical responsibility for their response to the issues the works present and how they present them. In both works under discussion, the women giving testimony make a verbal or physical allusion to there being no words for how their situation affects them. The danger here is that this failure of language has facilitated and sustained the success of statewide silence. However, while these works do not claim to directly represent the feelings or experiences of this kind of pain, their aesthetics and the performative acts of telling they present do communicate a sense of what spoken language language fails to, particularly in terms of marginalised or peripheral vision. In showing what should not be shown and in drawing attention to the authorities' acts of whitewashing, they indeed say what should not or cannot be said. Thus, these works confront their sensitive subject matter with integrity. At the same time, it should be recognised that it is Guzman's and Doherty's eventual success as award-winning internationally distinguished artists that allows them to continue working in more niche fields, to explore their at once intellectual, political and emotional curiosities about their home regions, and to provide interstitial global platforms to communicate the incommunicable. Although it is a concern for Doherty that his practice is more easily marketed at home and abroad as Irish landscape art, the way this traditionalism masks sensitive socio-political issues allows him to creatively avoid pressure or censorship from state authorities keen to promote forgetting the past and moving on, or indeed from paramilitary groups. The distribution and screening of Guzman's films, which directly intersect with politics, has been more problematic. His films are undeniable critiques of the Chilean state, past and present. 
They are also complex and multi-layered. As a result, they are considered by production companies to be unsellable. When Guzman first began circulating his script for Nostalgia for the Light to European and North American television companies, he and Sasha were met with only rejection for two years. The reason given was that the narrative had too many threads and that understanding their interrelationships would require deep thought and repeat viewing. Television companies tend not to expect viewers to want to make this effort, leading them to favour narratives that can be understood immediately, presenting human rights stories alongside astronomical and archaeological discoveries apparently does not comply with the conventions of the marketable television documentary. Guzman explains that, quote, when something is different, it's a problem, unquote, and that it is the responsibility of the documentarian to confront this problem by making the work regardless. The result is that the process is slow, as demonstrated by the long gaps between the release dates of his films. This is worth it though when the result is a film like Nostalgia for the Light, as its careful consideration, integrity and earnestness are felt in every beat. It is a polished and pristinely beautiful film whose production value masks its difficult journey from conception to finished article and which carries the tremendous pain of the many told through the testimonies of the few. The women's acts of scarring the unforgiving landscape for remains links Nostalgia for the Light an ancient ground most strongly, exploring the notion that it is primarily marginalised women who carry the burden of predominantly male conflicts centred on power, ownership and control. The work's position of betweenness as they shift from the margin to the centre is refracted in their forms, content and aesthetics. Both take a poetic and subjective approach to dealing with a similar theme and both interrogate the landscape albeit in different ways, using the latest film technologies and resulting aesthetic effects to disrupt the impenetrable nature of the landscape where the disappeared may be found. They uncover or recover the problems placed beyond vision, as represented by the notion of unearthing the physical corpses. The lingering gaze on the landscape in both films is loaded with the implication that there is, or was and is no longer, something there worth looking at, regardless of the state's misdirection of vision. It poses an invitation to the viewer to scrutinise and excavate what might lie beneath the surface rather than simply accepting the surface image. In disrupting the idyllic Irish landscape or the vastness of the Chilean desert, an insidious presence is discovered to be lurking. This presence is not necessarily that of the bodies, but also that of the hand of the state cleansing the memories of the past while refusing to acknowledge the reality of the material remains that linger out of sight, if they have been preserved at all. Moreover, the bodies function as metaphors for the psychic legacies of violence experienced in any place, not just their own. It is the persistence of the niche arts that has kept the issue of the disappeared and others alive the world over, and there is every indication that this will continue. In Northern Ireland, the mainstream media are at last beginning to take notice and news coverage has increased since the BBC documentary was aired. However, in 2015, arts and education in the region have experienced severe funding cuts delegated by the Northern Ireland Assembly, managed specifically by arts and education ministers who are members of the Nationalist Party Sinn Féin, at a time of conservative austerity in the UK. Worryingly, the grassroots community organisations that have facilitated the most healing have been most affected. On the part of the consociational devolved government that Northern Ireland currently has, there is an urgency to preserve the status quo and to not rock the boat lest the peace process be dismantled. The stifling of voices resulting from this contributes to official forgetting and ensures that the past stays in the past to the detriment of psychic healing and social justice. The story is reset and the loop begins again in real life. Circling that loop will always be the few who refuse to forget the people and issues excluded from official narratives. Guzman's and Doherty's careers demonstrate that dogged resistance to silence can, however gradually, work towards visualising the invisible and centralising the marginal.
So I hope you find that useful and of course this was published before the EU referendum in the UK and long before the breakdown of the power sharing assembly in Northern Ireland which has now broken the record for the longest ever period a country or a devolved region has gone without its own government ever. If you're a patron there will still be releases of some of the extra material that I produce so the likes of the outtakes from recordings that I've been putting out and you'll also be able to look at transcripts and the extended show notes that I produce as well for these podcasts. If you want to get in touch you can find us on Facebook and on Twitter look for AV Cultures. Please do give us a like, please follow, please share our stuff that would be so well appreciated. You can also email audiovisualcultures at gmail.com. Do check out our website it's audiovisualcultures.org wordpress.com if you want to listen to previous episodes they're all linked on the podcast page please do help us out if you can on patreon.com forward slash pea blair i also am very grateful to receive one-off donations to paypal.me forward slash pea blair where i'm trying to save up for new equipment keep the suggestions coming thanks again for the support take care and catch you next time